I believe sometimes as women, as girls, we forget our self-worth. Whether it's boundaries put up around us that prevents us to remember that we are strong, powerful women, or boundaries we put in ourselves that makes us think that we are not strong, that we aren't really worthy. My goal is to change that. My goal is to have you know that you are worthy, that you are capable of making a difference and a change, that you are capable of succeeding and pushing yourself. My podcast, Girls Who Run the World, shares stories of strong, powerful women that are changing the world, that impact their community through their everyday lives. I am so excited to share this podcast with you all, hoping that it makes you realize that you are strong, you are worthy, and you are powerful. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Today's guest is truly amazing. She is an Olympic swimmer, a world champion, a best-selling author, and a very talented speaker. She has led the world as one of the best swimmers and now impacts the world each day with the work she is doing. Katie is a powerful force in her community, and I'm beyond thrilled to be talking with her today. Thank you for joining me, and I could not be more excited. Thank you. I'm so excited to chat. I know. Um, So first, just tell us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about me. Um, Well, I grew up, um, I was born in California, Mm -hmm. Sunnyvale, California. So people always ask like, yo, you're a California girl. And and when people say, they're like, oh, that makes sense. I'm like, why? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I fell in love with the water. Um, Well, I would say I wanted to be in the water because a cool kid in our Mm -hmm. neighborhood was doing it. And so I signed up for summer league swim and instantly it was just, shivering like a leaf, super cold, like hated it. So I was there, retired at age five, took a year off and then came back and just really missed it and still didn't really click um, in terms of yeah. like, that competitive streak, but um, joined a summer or joined a year round team when I was seven. Um, and then I would say like really clicked into just being super passionate about swimming, super competitive and that bled into every other yeah. aspect of my life. Um, and at nine years old, I declared to everyone that I was going to make an Olympic team. That is so crazy. And so at nine years old, you wanted to, you knew you wanted to be an Olympian. Yes. And then what part of like the, your journey after that, did you think, oh wait, this is actually possible? Like did it become reality? Reality. I would say, I feel like I, mean, I watched my first Olympics, like remembering at age 11, I yeah. just turned 11. Um, and I remember watching Caitlin Sandino, who's a mm-hmm. dear friend of mine now. Um, she was 17 and I was like, oh my gosh, like if I can make a team young, I'm thinking like 2008, I'd be just turned 19, yeah. never imagining that I would make it when I was 15. Um, and then I would say a year out, it became potential. Like I remember telling my coach, if I could make the final at Olympic trials, that's going to set me up great, great experience yeah. for the, you know, the following quad. Um, And then I just kept shaving time that year. Like every single meet, it was multiple seconds. And you're like nine years old. No, no, no. At this point, I'm 11. And then at this point, like as we're getting closer and closer to 2004, I'm 12. I'm I mean, still very young to be like, I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer. Like that is like, it takes a lot. Okay. Yes. So 13, make my first cut. Olympic trials cut, Mm -hmm. which for people who don't know swimming or how it works, I mean, there's within an event at Olympic trials, I would say there's about 80 people, right? So you're, you could be 80th and you yeah. have to be top two in the nation to make the team. So you're still like a very far cry mm-hmm. from becoming an Olympian. Um, and that year leading up to 2004, I just turned 14. Um, I just, yeah, I just kept improving. And I would say three months out of Olympic trials in 2004, I hit a time that was top in the nation. And suddenly it went wow. from, oh wait, like, wow, like forget the final, like I actually have a shot to make this team. Um, And it yeah, I mean, it all happened really fast, which is the reason things played out the way they did. But yeah, it was, it was kind of a very fast, steep progression. What's that life like? I mean, like when I was like 11, I was like playing with my (laughs) wife flicker out on the front yard. I wasn't thinking about swimming, which is great. Um, But what that, what is that life like? Like when you have such a goal? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like I've been able to reflect on that more right, as I've looked back. Like in the moment, that was just no, like I didn't know anything different. Right. And so I think I just really – I think it, it, there's always that nature versus nurture mm-hmm. argument. I think, you know, part of it is my mom was an elite athlete. And so she I, – I, I didn't know to the extent that she was, but right. I think she just had that energy of, mm-hmm. you know, going after your goals and she supported that. Um, but I also think there was a piece of I just came out very – 
obsessive driven you know I had to organize my dolls in a certain way every night like that was just kind of how <laughs> yeah. it was um and I think once I I had this for better or for worse like obsessive gene where right. I I kind of got the taste of like wow if I work really hard and push myself to some discomfort I'm dropping time I'm I'm getting better and I just became addicted to that cycle and um it just then I started winning and I became addicted to that. Yeah. So it just kind of felt right and right. I guess normal because I didn't yeah, know Yeah, it was probably natural. I mean, your body natural. was doing it and it was just like coming on yeah. to you. Especially at that young age, like you're having so much fun while doing it. Like not many kids have this life where they were becoming like one of the best swimmers in the world. And yet here you are doing it with like such passion and like drive. Um, and like one of the one of the things I wanted to ask you is like, how did you really what like inspired you to go competitive while swimming like you were like doing a professional yeah go professional um I feel like it the opportunity presented itself so I was swimming the 04 Olympics it didn't go the mm-hmm. way I wanted um I made this kind of resurgence in 2005 broke my first American record you know won so three cool. three world championship gold medals and at the time I had just turned 16 and so you know I was approached by an agent mm-hmm. and just the opportunity to, to make money, to have my college paid for. Right. My parents sacrificed a lot for me to compete. Swimming is not a cheap sport. Cheap sport. <laughs> um, and so I just remember being so excited that I could do something that I loved and I was passionate about. I could make money. I could set up my future. Mm-hmm. And I, I just went for it. It just felt right and felt an, right. found an amazing agent and had, you know, parents and people and lawyers and people that I trusted around me to make right. sure it made sense. But um, yeah, I just, I, I seized the opportunity. Yeah, I think it's something, like, our stories are very different, but, like, you can definitely tell, like, the community that's built around you has a huge impact on what's that outcome, and then how are you getting there? Like, Kenzie and I growing up right now, we have a really big community of women mentors, female mentors, but also, like, a lot of male mentors, too, like, mm-hmm. with our dad and, like, all of, like, his buddies and everything, and I think it changes your mindset on, like, okay, wait, possibilities versus, like, dreams right when we mm-hmm. all talk about like when we're younger like this is my dream and it almost feels like when we're talking about like when we're young oh it's like a fantasy like my dream would be like for you to like to win an olympic race or to like go into the olympics just race in the olympics and yet like you had this like passion that that's a lot of credit to you all the credits to you but also this community that's like oh no it's a possibility like you can do it and so yet there are, are all these high moments like where how did you overcome the moments that weren't like the low ones, like the hard. Oh, yeah. I feel like I just decided to like get it out of the way fast. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I will, I will say one thing of just the environment aspect that you just touched on, mm-hmm. like MBAC, you know, you walk into, it's also the the worst pool. Like it has like rust. I actually like, have heard about you'd, this. You'd walk my in, <laughs> Todd walked in, my husband walked in and he was like, this is, this is the pool. This is Michael <laughs> Phelps pool. Like yeah. this is where all the Olympians, I'm like, yeah, because that doesn't matter. Like you just need water. You yeah. just need, you know, a great coaching staff. And you we know, walk in and there's like this wall of all these Olympians from like back in like the seventies, eighties, you mm-hmm. know? And so that becomes just like, that is the norm, right. right? It's not, like you said, it's not like you're, you don't, I never put making an Olympic team or Olympian up on a pedestal. Yeah. Maybe when I was nine or 10, but as I grew and as I met these athletes, I'm like, Okay, like they're not. It's that, a possibility. Yeah, it's they're not, not like that different. Fantasy. Yeah, yeah, like they're not that different from me. They put in the work. They go after it. You know, there's a combination of talent, luck, mm-hmm. drive. But um, I think I just always had that belief of just like, why not me? Yeah. Um, and I think you know my first real deep setback was on a world stage at the Olympic yeah. Games. You know, and and you know going to an Olympics it was the first time I'd ever left the country. I was away from my parents for six weeks. Like back then, 2004, there's no yeah. like, there's like pay phones. I was like dialing in. Like it was, it was awful. My coach wasn't able to, to come and travel with oh, me. Oh, really? Yeah. So I was just on this island. I was, I was homeschooled. So I was super naive, yeah. just super out of my element and fell on my face in front of millions of people. Right. And I think it was this moment of, I always talk about, you know, I'm, I'm actually grateful that it happened sooner than later because right. I think a lot of people go through life kind of walking on eggshells, like, oh my gosh, like, how will I react if I right. fail in a big way? And it's like, nope, I'm just going to do it on the <laughs> largest stage possible at the age of 15 years old. And I think it just taught me a lot about myself. Yeah. Like, okay. Like I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to lick my wounds. I'm, I'm going to grieve. But you know, a week later I was like, okay, like, let's figure out how I come back and show people that 
Right. I'm not just this flash in the pan or this wasn't luck. Like I'm here to stay. And right. um, I just, I think, showed myself that I could be relentless even in the most dire low situation. Yeah, you're in, you were literally, the Olympics are watched by everyone and yeah. anyone. Oh, yeah. And so what are the nerves like? What's your mind like before going into that? Oh, just terror. Yeah, <laughs> like, I can imagine. Terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because I feel like, you know, there's obvious, I, I don't think there's ever been a race where I wasn't in some way fearful, right? right. Even though you, I was super uh, dialed into my training and my paces yeah. and you're in that ready room and you're having all the emotions. Like anyone who tells you different is, is not being fully <laughs> truthful. Um, and I obviously got better at managing those nerves. Probably. I was always um, just a very hyper anxious little kid. Like I remember even throwing up when I was 12 and 13 before big races and yeah. just getting hyper anxious. And so I learned to manage those nerves, but I do think that it did take away some of the joy, right? right. Like I, I'm in an Olympic final at the age of 15 years old and I, which you know, is incredible. I, yeah. Thank you. But I didn't look around and go, oh my gosh, like I'm in an Olympic final with right. off on my cat. You know? I feel like and, that's how like a lot of things are. Sorry to cut you yeah. off, but that's how like a lot of things are is in the moment we're not realizing like this, a big accomplishment, like people in general, like, all yeah. these, like they're not realizing this big accomplishment that they're going through and then like years will go by and you're like, okay, wait, I got to give myself grace a little mm -hmm. bit because 15 years old, like, I can't even imagine where my head would be at. I'd probably be, like, peeing myself, to be honest. <laughs> like, I'm not even lying. <laughs> but yeah. um, I want to talk a little bit about the wins now after that. So you, the first one was Athens, Greece, correct? Yes. And then Beijing was that? Beijing was the uh, 2008. And yeah. the, is that where you got two bronze? No. Uh, silver and two bronze. Silver and two bronze. Yes. So what was that like winning? Um, I mean, I would say like some of the wins are definitely maybe in the in between. Yeah. Um, like I mean, I so I I kind of kept upping the ante on myself. Yeah. Right. It's like 2004. I make the team. I went to events at trials. I'm you know supposed to be this child prodigy that wins all these medals, yeah. and I didn't. Yeah. Um, and then I came back through that quad with this just like this kind of like prove it to everyone mentality. Broke my first American record, broke my first world record in 2007. Um, and then suddenly everyone's, you know, calling me this female Michael Phelps, which is a great honor, but he was trying to win eight gold medals. I had right. like, one to my name. Yeah. But that expectation, um, you know, I I went into those games, swam five events. Yeah. Swam actually well. Like I was right off some of my times. I broke an American record in the turn of three, anchored in the fastest time of yeah. an American. But I left those games – most times when you get out of a race, you go through, it's called the mix zone. Okay. And so there's all these reporters and mm. press and asking, yeah, and like from different countries. I'd be like, I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and every single time it was met with like, what happened? Yeah. What's wrong? Um, And so I left, I, I don't look back on 2008 with happy memories. Right. At all. Just because. I mean, you're conditioned in this way. You talk about walking down and these, these media people have so much. Like they expect something from yeah. you, right? Yeah. Would you agree? I would say, yeah. I mean, I think it's just the mentality of like it's gold or nothing, yeah. right? You know, and I think I actually got really emotional watching uh, Tokyo because I actually felt like some of the athletes that got a silver medal or yeah. a bronze medal like were being celebrated. Yeah. And maybe it was just my blinders, but in 2008, I did. I again, if I hadn't been positioned to win right. five gold medals, yeah. or which was not a was not a realistic expectation. Yeah. But it is a lot of pressure. Female Michael Phelps, like – Yeah, it's a terrible, that's a terrible It's name. a terrible name. Even though it's like, thanks for the compliment, all yeah. the pressure that comes with that because you're totally different. Totally different. different. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and I, I look back on like some of those swims and I'm like, they were actually really great swims for me. Like mm -hmm. I had broken the world record in the 400 I am at trials and I was right off that time. It just happened right. to be that two other girls went super fast that day, you right. know? And so – it took me a really long time, a really long time to recover from that and and feel good about my medals and right. and feel like, you know, those those were things I could be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, but I also feel like it's taught me of, again, like if the goal doesn't go perfectly, right. what do you do? How do you get back, back from it? How do you find a silver lining? All yeah. those things. Um, and I think, you know, obviously the, the highs of breaking a world record or, yeah. you know, winning, you know, world championship gold medals. Those are things I look back on super fondly. Um, it just happened to not be at Olympic Games. Right. And so you talk about, well, the Olympics are something that it's seriously the best of the best there. Mm -hmm. You say Olympic trials is 80 people. You said it would make that cut. 
and two, make the team, right? Yeah, and I would say, I mean, in terms of, like, athletes that even make Olympic trials, it's, like, 1% of… That's insane. So, yeah. what the, what is that like being surrounded by the best swimmers all ages? Were any of them your mentors? Like, what was that like to be in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I would say 2004 was interesting because there was a girl that I was super obsessed with. Her name was Maggie Bowen. Mm-hmm. She went to Auburn. I wore like an Auburn cap. like, I, And she kind of took me under her wing a year out and was like teaching me, you know, different turns. And yeah. and I ended up racing against her at Olympic trials and beating her. Oh, really? So it's, it's, a very, it's a very wild thing to be like, even um, – this woman named Jenny Thompson. She's an mm-hmm. icon. And two years prior, I had her poster on my wall above my bed. So it's yeah. like this shift of like, okay, these people were once my idols, but in order to make my goal, and I now they're com- your competitors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say 04 was a very weird experience. Um, 08, I would say I felt way more of a veteran. You know, I'd been on a lot of national yeah. teams at that point, um, and a lot. Of, I mean. My three of the six girls in my wedding party were Olympic teammates, you know, so so many of them like, I mean, so many of them, you're racing head to head, you hate their guts in that moment, you touch the wall and they're they're one of your best friends again. So it's, uh, it's interesting, but you do build this camaraderie and relationship with these people because they're also going through this high stress, crazy situation. Um, And so, I mean, I I look back on 2008 Olympic trials as just kind of all stars aligned and race after race, I I got my hand on the wall first. And I mean, eight days of racing is a lot, but (laughs) somehow, I don't know how I swam so many (laughs) events, but I was able to plug through. Yeah. So what role did coaching and like mentorship play in your life at that time? Uh, I wish there had been more, I would yeah. say. I mean, I think when you look at, and I think it's becoming because mental health and, and yeah. those things are talked about more these days. But I mean, in 2004, it was, it's, it's very much like I would, I compared it in my book to the Hunger Games. Like yeah. coaches are stressed because they have athletes. Athletes are stressed. And so it's really hard to be there for other people. And I don't, discredit yeah, anyone yeah. for that but it's just I, I felt very much kind of on an island and mm-hmm. you know I was obviously really struggling just being away from home mm-hmm. and um there was even some bullies on the team in 04 um I would say I would say mentors and coaches came into play for me later in my life right um I would say like I have a ton of like business mentors now um there's definitely been some coaches in my life yeah. that were really supportive on the mental side. Um, but it wasn't during that era. Yeah. 04, 08, I would say it was after. Yeah. But um, I would say what I've taken from the people that have done a really good job of it is kind of how I want to be, how right. I want to show up for athletes or friends or colleagues um, and, and just kind of understanding, you know, what's, what's positive, what's negative, what works, what resonates. Um, right. I've definitely learned a lot from that. Yeah, we talk about like mental health not being talked about as much. And – I mean, you're in 2004, and now we're in, like, yeah, like well, 20, not to, like, say the years, 20 years but things yeah. have changed. Like, if you were yeah. swimming now, the talk of mental health with swimmers, health, like, all of these things, I think it would have been different. Would you agree? A hundred percent. And so what is that like when – or maybe I should ask you, like, are people – were swimmers, like, shy and not saying, like, oh, I'm having anxiety about this? Or did you feel like it was, like – you could confine in other swimmers and talk about these struggles or was everyone just kept to themselves? Oh yeah. No one talked about that. Yeah. Like you'd be like, I'm nervous, but no one, I mean, the, the weeks leading up to the Olympic games in 2004, I was, I mean, having a, a mean, panic attack. Like mm-hmm. it just was so to be on this team with all these, I mean, there's some people in their mid twenties yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm 10 years younger. Um, it just, it just wasn't, so it wasn't even something that you had the awareness of, right. right? Of like, oh, wait, like this is not normal. I shouldn't feel like this. I shouldn't be having like panic. Right. Um, it's no, nerves are normal. Like that's going to happen yeah. with anything. But um, it just wasn't something that I could even put a name to. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Which is crazy. Which I find that's that. so interesting now because yeah. like I grew up in the time where it started. To yeah. We talked about like I was like in middle school and I think we started talking about things like that. Yeah. But, um. I just can't imagine, like, all the stress that you build up inside, you know, mm-hmm. and, like, anxiety. Like, maybe that's not – I don't know if that's the right word, but 
you're so anxious about this goal. And also it's your first time doing it after years of having this goal. Yeah. Like I can't imagine what it's like to like be there that be one in day, it. Yeah. You know? Like it's here. Um, I did want to ask. Oh, so when did you stop swimming? Was it 2018? So yeah, I, re- I was essentially forced into retirement um, in 2015 because uh, I got a blood clot in my mm-hmm. lung. And what was, if you don't mind me asking, like what was that experience like? Uh, horrific. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, it, it, I talked about kind of not being able to really appreciate 04 and 08. Yeah. And um, I was making a comeback for 16 and I was enjoying the process so much. Like yeah. I just felt like I found rhythm and I found kind of perspective. And um, so going into 2014, we went to nationals and um, I mean, I had this like, stabbing pain in my rib area. So great that I actually passed out because I couldn't even get air in. Um, and went through this massive journey. And you were there at nationals? Yeah. Yeah. So I went through, yeah, I went through this whole ordeal. No one, I mean, I basically went through seven weeks of misdiagnoses, definitely could have died. Um, and then that's actually why I do a ton of advocacy work now for the National Blood Clot Alliance, because it's just something that's not, especially with young, fit, healthy people, doctors don't. Yeah. know what to look for and what to ask and people don't know how to self-diagnose or yeah. advocate and so yeah it was I had two blood clots in the bottom of my right lung for seven weeks and finally got a diagnosis but at that point there was like scar tissue buildup and um it just it obviously so many you need your lungs and right, yeah. so I ended up retiring in 2015 because it just wasn't working like right. I wasn't able to hit the paces I was constantly breathless um yeah so which takes I think what something isn't as talked about when people retire, especially after something that's so horrific and terrifying after mm-hmm. finding out, um, is like like that decision to decide, okay, this isn't for me. You know, you dedicated your life to this mm-hmm. thing. And then, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to say, okay, this is best. what's best for me. Mm-hmm. And it takes someone that's really like, right-minded and just be okay this is like I'm gonna die doing this if I keep trying and pushing yeah I'm gonna survive and just say like put this to rest and Mm -hmm. leave my career where it was at um I did want to talk about post-olympic I guess you could say depression maybe and maybe or let down of like did you have any feelings after you know you did the olympics and then you've been training for this race and then what's that like after it's done I'd say very different between the two Olympics. Like after 2004, I was just on this like revenge tour. So okay. it's like I was obviously upset by my performances, but it was like, okay, sit down with my coach, reset, and let's get back to work. So yeah. I didn't really have that. Um, after 08, I wish, I wish I had taken more time away to just decompress what just happened. You know, yeah. it's like obviously you have different sponsors and contracts and you you have to keep rolling but i felt like i just needed to bury it and keep rolling yeah. um when i feel like i didn't even have time to process what was ha- what had happened right. and and all of that so i i feel like if yeah there was definitely depression um i don't know if it was because of the actual Olympics or just the performance and the buildups. Yeah. But yeah, everyone goes through yeah. kind of like, oh my God, am I going to gear up for another four years? Right. Like, like I've read, that's why I asked that question is I've read recently about like this post Olympic depression because it's the best of the best. And then like you do this thing and then you're like, what's next? Mm-hmm. And like this question of what's next. And I was just wondering if you ever had that like fear of like, what do you do? I think, I guess the post Olympic depression is more to me like, if you're retiring, like I, you know, and every year, like there's world championships and like, it's, it's funny, like world championships is the same athletes, the same Same people. It's just sometimes more competitive. Um, so you, you're always looking ahead of like that next summer. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times like if the performance doesn't go how you want, you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to get up and do this again. Um, I think it's easier. Like I always felt like a season was easier to get back into if like it ended on this super amazing note and I did all my goals and I I was pumped about it. I I would be so ready to come back after just like a week. Yeah. Um, But after the Olympics, because it didn't go how I wanted, it it definitely was tough to be like, all right, I have world championships in eight months. Like I got, yeah. So your mind was on something else. Yes. Yes. Um, So then now I want to talk about, your life now, like the great life that you live now as an entrepreneur. 
and all the things that you're doing. Um, first, what was that transition like in basically re, I don't want to say redefining, but people, I, re- I listened to your ritual podcast and you talked about how you were trying to make this name in the corporate world mm-hmm. without having people give all the credit to you being an Olympian almost. Mm-hmm. So what's that like? Of Like I'm Katie Hoff and as it great, as great as it is to say, I'm an Olympian, I've won these medals. I've been, I'm a world champion. What is it like kind of like making this own path for yourself yeah. besides like Olympian always being drawn into it? I mean, it's taken basically a decade. Yeah. Um, I would say like, I've gone kind of, you know, I, like like you heard on Ritual, like I went to this, like, I'm just going to reinvent myself. I'm going to, you know, forget about like those accomplishments. Um, And again, like, I think that was partly because I didn't make peace and address things within my career. And Mm -hmm. I don't regret the way that it's gone because it's not something you you can't speed up that healing. Like it, it's just unfortunately, right? Like we wish we could just be like snap our fingers (laughs) and not be patient. But I just think I, I had to go through some of the, the pain and the struggle and um, try different things and and figure out what works. Um, but you know, I think certain milestones throughout that decade helped me kind of process and, um, own things and feel, feel pride around my accomplishments. Um, you know, doing the Ted talk was a big one, being able to, you know, share my experience authentically, um, which was, was huge. Writing my book was another one. Um, you know, I would say going to this, this, you know, Hoffman retreat yeah. recently how was kind of the final clear out. Um, but, you know, I just was, there was always these peaks and valleys of like, okay, like, I think I found it. I think I yeah. feel good about this. And then, no, I don't, you know, yeah. and, and it's just kind of riding that wave. And I think the thing that I'm probably most proud of, or the reason I've gotten to this point is I just kind of kept plugging and kept right. going, even though sometimes it was really painful or yeah. I didn't, didn't make sense. Um, like, like, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. Um, but I just kind of kept putting one foot in front of the other and being like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to eventually get yeah, there. I feel like, sorry. I feel like you've seen like all the great things you can do with your story. Like you don't have a, re- there's nothing normal yeah. about your, your story. <laughs> there really is. Yeah. Yeah. And so Ted talk, like going on all of these podcasts, um, your book. I also want to talk about that. Like what, how did you decide to write a book? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's I always I actually really credit and I feel like it's rare in your life that you can point back and be like oh this was a moment yeah. that shifted like I'm I'm not that present I'm trying to be but yeah. like that was one where I remember I gave a speech and this woman from Microsoft um was also giving one and she was like you need a book and I was like why she's like because you need to keep speaking and sharing your story like yeah. that was so impactful and I always say um, I really appreciate this always makes people like now self-conscious talking to me, but like hopefully it won't do that to you. But like I really genuinely appreciate compliments mm-hmm. when they're unprompted and specific. Yeah. Because I feel like, you know, after a speech or after like, you know, so many people were coming up and being like, good job, good job. And I'm like, are you like I feel like you're just saying right, that because yeah, I came yeah. in front of your path and you feel yeah, obligated. Yeah. And she came up to me and gave me just like very specific compliments. Super unprompted, like she she yeah. sought me out, and I just remember being like, "Wow, maybe maybe I can do this, and maybe right. it's okay if like certain parts of my story aren't." And I always viewed it as like, if I talk about the hard parts, it's being negative, yeah. right? It's, but everyone goes right. through stuff, yeah. right? So it's relatable. It helps people hear my story, and maybe like one thing resonates and yeah. helps them get get up in the morning. Um, and so that was kind of the first like, I'd always given speeches on behalf of like Speedo, right. but it wasn't yeah. an actual keynote. And yeah. that was the first time where I was like, maybe I could do this, yeah. but I need a book. Like you have to have a book. Right. Like, it's just kind of like your token. It's your yeah, calling it's card. Thing. And even then I, so we moved to New York and I kept in, you know, the corporate world and I was still not brave enough because I was so worried. How am I going to write a memoir and have it be very genuine and authentic and not all people out right. and not make it about my story. But there's a lot of things that happened. And, yeah. and I had tried, jump started and stopped probably three or four times mm-hmm. throughout those years to write this book. And I always, it always ended in me in tears, me giving up and frustrated. And so we- But you have, yeah, always came back to it. I love that. I, yeah, like I feel like I was always like, oh, I really feel like it would be helpful, but more on a selfish reason of just very cathartic to work through all these things. Okay. 
But I was always like, I, first of all, I'm not a novelist. Like, I don't feel like I can do this justice. And right around that time, we had my mom, it's crazy. Like, my mom was really good friends with this novelist. Mm-hmm. And I remember being like, well, talk to him. Maybe he could be, you know, help you and be a ghostwriter. And I remember thinking, like, really, like, a 50-year-old man is going to, like, capture my voice? Like, how is this going to work? But I took the calls. Like, what I, at that point, I was like, I'm just going to say yes to everything. Yeah. Like, I took the call. And we started talking. And I was like um, – he was like, you know what I think about your story? And, and he's like, you know what book that I really think would be very nice to – have similarities towards mm-hmm. is the book Open by Andre Agassi. Mm-hmm. And I was like, literally, that is the book that I'm like, wow, it's so vulnerable. It's so, so he good. knows. He knew. Yeah. I'm like, how did you, did you talk to someone? But he's like, no. Like, like, my I was mom like, told you. <laughs> yeah. No, my mom didn't even know that. And so I was like, wow. And so I decided to just take a shot on him. Yeah. And I remember he sent over the prologue and I, it was like, how he says, he's like, it was, it was in your vo- voice better than your voice. Yeah, like he that's just, what you'd say. Um, and so we basically went through a year of just basically therapy. I mean, yeah. I just like threw up words at him and told my story. And, um, you know, unfortunately it happened during – fortunately, unfortunately it happened during COVID. Like, yeah. fortunately I feel like I was able to get it done really fast and yeah. just dedicate a ton of time to it. Unfortunately, like I didn't get to go on any like tour. Tours it was like and, all podcasts yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But – um. Yeah, I feel like it was it, it was very cathartic to go through some of those periods and yeah. talk through them and and frame my story in the way that I wanted to. Um, I mean, I think it's it's the memoir scr- scratches the sur- surface. Um, mm-hmm. If I'm like working on another book, yeah. which is going to oh, be so more exciting. of yeah, more of like kind of a self help yeah style. Oh, I'm gonna have to read. I love yeah. it. I actually have your book. Actually, fun fact, I'm like, you have the audio. Books. You could do audio book. I do that. I like an audio book. I was just talking to. Mr. Todd and we were talking about like reading and I'm like I just need like my phone to be in a different room no one around me to me to like actually sit down and get into the mm-hmm. book and then but I also like a book like as a memoir I like reading someone's story mm-hmm. rather than like a love story or a romance story I really yeah. like because I can be impacted by that so or like what my dad says is you only need like one for the podcast for example you only need that one listener like you just need that one yeah. listener that disconnects and then mm-hmm. it makes all these connections that's almost with your book is like there could be one sentence in that entire book and that person's like this is my book this yeah this is my book and that's what I think is so powerful about having a book is because like all the different parts connect with different people but I was gonna ask like how did you get into so you wrote the book and then is that when your public speaking career kind of started yeah I had had I did TED talk and then I mean I'm still I, that's partly why I want to write the second book because yeah. I feel like yeah, tell us about that. I feel like the memoir is great, but there's no in terms of like how I structure my keynote mm-hmm. um, is not like I'm not just telling a story in a keynote, right? right? I want there to be tangible takeaways so that people can come away and feel like they can take action. Um, but yeah, I think that I, I can't even remember like the first one. I just had people start reaching out. That's um, so awesome. Just through you know, friends of friends and, yeah. and seeing different stuff of podcasts I had done. So that was kind of my first experience of like going into a company mm-hmm. and not having it just be, you know, a swim group or a team yeah. or something like that. Um, and so I, I very much compare public speaking to a performance. You know, it's yeah. so – there's so many similarities of being in the ready room, being behind the curtain before you go out for the speech, mm-hmm. the high of adrenaline, and then, you know, feeling like you did a great job and, um, you know, the high afterwards. So yeah. – and – there's never a perfect speech. Yeah. So there's always things that you can improve and get feedback on. And I kind of, I love that journey as well. That's, a, I took a public sp- speaking class in my first year of semester. It was 8 a.m. class, like our public speaking lab. So we had to like give these speeches at like 8 a.m. And I always thought I was like an outgoing person. And then I realized like as I started doing the podcast more and I started doing public speaking, I actually get pretty nervous before doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started to watch a lot of like TED Talks and all these videos. and trying to understand like all these people had to prepare like I am and they have to get up and do one of the biggest speeches ever. And so like as I look at you as a great public speaker, I'm like there's people that, you know, there's ways to learn how to become better, Mm -hmm. you know, and I am 18 years old, but I think it's still such a great lesson to learn at a young age from like great mentors. 100%. Like you, but it's a great um, tool to be able to have. And 
I'm happy that you're doing it now. Like, do you just love doing it? I love it. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's to, um, yeah, to be able, it's a skill set to be able to craft a message in a way that is going to resonate with people and be relatable. Um, I think the piece I've struggled with and where I have a lot more clarity now, um, like as of recently, yeah. is just feeling like how do I pull in, you know, obviously a lot of things that I did in my swimming career. I retired, you know, eight years ago. So how do I pull in, obviously, everything from my swimming career, that those are, right. e- those are easy things to talk about, but things then in my transition and valued there. Right, because right? that's a big part of your story. Would you agree, like, that transition into, like, the Olympian, now you? And you're, but you're the same person. You're still doing I don't but know. But I've never – that's the thing is I've never talked about. Like, I yeah. never – like, I will not – like, literally within a last month, it's just like, okay, well, just because I'm not currently a CEO – or just because I'm not the best in the world at what I'm doing, there's still value in how I've been able to kind of totally. build back yes. up. And I never really thought that. So yeah. I would only talk about, okay, you know, breaking world records and all these things when in actuality, like people go through transitions all the time. Yeah. And so there's actually a lot of gems in there of how I've navigated that over the last decade. Um, so stay tuned for that. Well, I'm excited. Definitely- <laughs> like, this is good. This is what I need to talk about because – as I've gotten older, um, I had like we can call it a transition. Like my during COVID, I know people always say that, but it really was like those couple of years in high school. Middle school was really hard for me. High school was still like a great four years for me, but like self worth coming up with the podcast, kind of being embarrassed to mm-hmm. come out about the podcast, like just being like, "Hey, I'm doing this cool thing," which no one was doing at my age at that time. Yeah, and then now I have started to find more friends that have podcasts too. Um, but had this transition moment where I'm like, I don't, well, I care. I care. And well, I don't care about what people think, but I do care at the same time. And then understanding like, this is what I want to do and Mm -hmm. to be able to do and accomplish all these goals and be inspired by some of the world's greatest female mentors. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but basically it's more of like, I think your book would be great because understanding what that transition is, Mm -hmm. you know, like there's not a name to it yet. And there's like, yeah, it's like self-discovery almost. I don't know. Something like that. But I like that. That was interesting to think about. Of like, Is that in your second book? Yeah. I mean, it's all definitely come from like you talk anyone. Also, anyone who says that I don't care what people think about think about me is a, is lying. I know. I'm like, like, I definitely care. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's like, you know, strangers on the internet, like that's yeah. a place where it's like, okay, like even that can bother yeah. you. But if like, there's someone that you care about or remotely know yeah. and they're saying negative things or yeah. you know, being a hater, like regard, like you're, it's still going to bother you. I yeah. think the, the true win or the true protection is like truly believing and having this strong belief of right. who you are and and why you matter and why you're enough. Right. And I think I've always been someone and it's obviously from sport um, or just even as a young kid of just like the affirmation, mm-hmm. like I'm literally addicted, you yeah. know, and, and I think, um, you know, even my love language is, is words of affirmation. That's mine too. I need um, it. <laughs> so I think that's, you know, as I look at things, I'm like, that is, you know, you become addicted to it and then it's never going to be enough. Right. right? It's always going to be, okay, if I get to this next goal, if I break this record, if I get this promotion, if I make right. this much money, like you're, there, the goalpost just keeps moving, moving further and you never get there. It's like really, really hard to find joy and satisfaction and happiness. Right. And then you will be super bothered by what everyone else is saying because yeah. you're whole being of existence is dependent on those affirmations right from those others such, that's such a great explanation <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a terrible yeah. place to be yeah. and i've i've i mean it's been the last decade right and yeah. i can even though again this is not as this is nowhere close to the olympics but i ran chicago two years ago i was a senior in high school i told people i was gonna run they were like there's no way you're running chicago marathon like it's not gonna happen like you're not running a marathon at the age of 16 like are you even like, is that even allowed? I was like, no, I'm going to do it. And so I trained for it. Very hard time with me training because I set so much expectations for this run has to be perfect. I do mm-hmm. it at this pace. If I don't do it at this pace, if I walk, like, I'm not a runner. And so I really struggled during that time as it was a great time in my life that I realized, oh, wait, I can actually do this. There were moments where, like, I ran and then I did the race, finished nowhere close to where I wanted to run. And then I was really bothered by that for that next couple – that month. I was yeah. embarrassed to tell people 
that I ran Chicago Marathon at, the, at that age because I was like, I don't want them to ask the time. I don't want them to yeah. ask because it wasn't the time that I was proud of. Yet now I'm like, okay, I ran a marathon. Like you said, I ran a marathon at the age of 16. I got to give myself grace with that, mm-hmm. right? And so, and going back to the whole like, I don't care thing. I've always been someone that loves affirmation. I like text, like in my text, I like always, I probably give too much like compliments and I'm like always hyping the person up and I'm really big into like, when I was younger, I really cared about what people think. Now I do even more, but with more Mm self-confidence. And um, I think I just connect with what you beautifully just said with just knowing, you know, if you know yourself and you give yourself that love, then you know entirely what you deserve. And yeah. you can take those words that people give you, good or bad, with, you know, like, thought of, like, oh, this maybe I can get better at this. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I would say it's the, I mean, it's definitely the awareness of that. Like, you're never going to be, you're never going to just be, like, perfectly, like, I am, I am, you know, queen and and nothing can bother me. And, right. you know, what, like, that's, that's not realistic. Mm-hmm. I think it's having the understanding of, where does it come from? You know, that's something I've recently learned of the awareness, how to express it, how to how to move on from that. And I think not like feeling like you have choice in the matter. Mm-hmm. Right. I think a lot of times I felt just so out of control with this just need right. to have that affirmation and not feeling like, OK, like, no, no, no. Like I can slow down enough to understand like, wait, why? Why do I care? Like, why right. do I need this affirmation if I, what I know I'm doing really is special. Right. Um, it's funny. I have similar – this part of why I was like, I really need to get help because <laughs> I I had this – this I had this thought and working through it of just like basically like if it's not world class, mm-hmm. um, which I view as extraordinary, mm-hmm. like if it's not like the best in the world, then it's not worth being proud of myself mm-hmm. around, right? And that obviously comes from swimming. Wow. And, yeah, definitely. Um, so I decided to run this marathon because Todd was going to do it. And I was like, yeah, all right, fine, I'll do it. I always was Wait, like, I'm, this one this fall. Uh, no, I did, oh, you did, I did one two months ago in Nashville here. You did the Nashville rock and roll? Yeah. That is like one of the hardest. Oh, yeah. It? I found that out after. So <laughs> so I basically I'm like, whatever. I have, I have no emotion about this. I'm going to do this. And just like just hating the whole process. Like yeah. the 18 miles on the weekends, like mm. m- brutal, miserable. Yeah. Um. But I was like, you know what, I'll, whatever. I'll, I'm helping Todd out. Yeah. I'll train with him. But then we separated because we can't run together. We just get in fights because yeah. we have different styles. So we're like, bye. <laughs> um, and I – so I ended up I ended up getting obviously super competitive, as you mentioned. I'm looking yeah. at my clock all the time. And yeah, I didn't know the elevation game was like um, the insane. hardest. Like, yeah. <laughs> that is not the beginner marathon. I no. <laughs> and uh, so I was on pace for like my goal. My goal initially was under four. Mm-hmm. Then it was 345. And so I was on pace for that for 21 miles. Um, and then I could feel <laughs> that's so great. I don't know. Well, just wait. Uh, and I could feel like, you know, I run very much like a swimmer where like literally like breaststrokes. So like, it's like this. And so uh-huh. I could start to feel like my IT bands tightening up and I'd never, I understand that that happened another week yeah. to me. So at 21 miles, I had this stabbing pain, like in my right knee, like to the point where I was like, I, I, I just, it was instant tears. Like it was like out of control yeah. crying. And I'm like, I'm at 21 miles. miles. I'm like, I have, I have five miles left. And I just had this moment. I was like, I'm going to figure out how to like peg leg this and like straight this leg. Any, whatever. Anyways, yeah. my, my Todd and my mom came to my rescue and Todd was just like, you're going to keep going. I'm like, yeah, I ha- I'm just going to walk. Yeah. This. But I had this moment of one, what does it matter if it's like 345 or 415, right? Um, yeah. Which is what it, I think it was like 415. But I crossed the That fin- is really great time. I mean, I would pray. I would well, pray. thank you. But no, but I, here's how, when I was like, wow. Uh, so I crossed the finish line. I'm looking around and, you know, everyone's crying and in tears and like hugging people. And I am like no, nothing. I don't yeah. have one shred of emotion. If anything, I'm like this, is, like just disgusted. I'm like, yeah. this is, that was terrible. That yeah. was so slow. I I don't feel good about this. Like, and like hundreds of thousands of people run a marathon and why should I be proud of myself for that? Yeah. You know? And I was like having these emotions and I'm like realizing that one, saying that to anyone is they're going to be like, what's wrong yeah. with you? We have a party after but everyone's not. like, yeah. good job. And I'm like, I don't deserve your good job. Yeah. You know? And I, it was like kind of this like start of this unwrapping of like, okay, but you still ran a marathon. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, like why why are you so like even the knee thing, but right, even yeah. regardless if I had gone like three forty five, which is yeah. still like what? What does Des Linden go? Two twenty five? You know, like <laughs> it's not I mean. it's nothing, you know, and look, <laughs> why do I feel like I need why do I feel like I need to be world class in order to feel proud? Yeah. And it's that setting that goalpost, moving yeah. that goalpost all the time. And so that was definitely like a a piece of unra- unpacking that of like it goes yeah. back to just not feeling enough if it's not extra- right. extraordinary, right? Which yeah. is like what is that? And so now from New York, I'm yeah. planning to just like actually just enjoy the electricness of the city because I was there yeah. last year and like not care about the time, which is yeah. radical. I was there for last me. year. Oh my goodness, we were in the city together. Yes, that was also so fun. that's that's my goal for New York to just yeah. enjoy it. I am right now. I think, I think what I took from Chicago and I can relate now. Taking I took two years off, a year and a half, off, two years maybe. I think so. I ran Chicago in the fall twenty twenty one. Yeah. So about two years is I was so worried about that race. And again, nobody was running it like it wasn't like all my friends are running it. and beating me next to me. Like I wasn't like I did have family friends there that were going out for like record times, like break break their PR. But I knew I was going to come in last. And yet I still put this very high expectation on me. I hit a wall at mile 20. Always. And (laughs) my bottom of my feet were burning and I was crying tears. And I'm like this is the worst moment of my life is right here is because <laughs> I can hear, I literally, it's the finish line is so loud. I'm like two miles away. You're a mile away in Chicago and you can hear like the party and the band. And here I am. And I'm like barely running. Like my mm-hmm. mom and sister saw me and they were like, got it, honey. I was like, I know I look terrible right now. Oh I'm yeah. I've been running. I was like yeah. skipping. Like, um, and so uh, I finished that race. I felt great. You know, I was, I did, I was one of the people who, like crying. Very envious of you probably in that moment. <laughs> well, my father started crying and I was like, I was uh, crying. And then I was crying the next day after because I'm like, my body feels <laughs> yeah, stiff as For a different board. reasons. Um, but then my dad, then I went through this month thing where I was just really embarrassed was just the word. I was mm-hmm. feeling this way. And then my dad's like, you did 26.2 miles, right? The winner of the marathon did 26.2 miles. They have that ability, and maybe one day you will, but probably not. But anyway, (laughs) they have this ability to run. Deslinden can run 225, right? Madison can run five something. And yet it's like we ran the same distance, and I'm hella proud of that girl that ran, and I should be proud of myself too. Mm -hmm. So it's now understanding, like, I did the distance, and now so for New York – each day, I'm, like, fighting this battle in my mind that I run. I'm, like, telling my mind to shut up because I get up and run. Like, and that's mm-hmm. the most important thing is, like, yeah. realizing I'm putting in the work. And then I, when I get to New York, I'm really going to have a lot of fun with it, I hope. I, like, want people that – we had a photographer come with us in, in Chicago. And it's, like, the greatest thing ever is because they were, like, taking all these funny photos of Dad and I before – well, I was like, no photos. No yeah, one you're like, more get photo. out. <laughs> My hair was probably awful. But New York, I'm like, I want a photographer. Like, you can hire people to come to it. And I'm like, I wanted to do it again. I want to stop and take photos. Like, I really want to remember the run. Like, I didn't remember those last couple miles yeah. in Chicago. It was so frustrating in my mind. Which, obviously, people hit a wall. Like, that happens. But also, I'm like, maybe I can – my mind cannot let me hit the wall that time. Like, <laughs> if I train well enough. Um but I agree with that. I think that also connects with a lot of things in life with people mm-hmm. like just learning from not even a mistake, learning from a past event and being like, okay, this is where I get better. And this mm-hmm. is how I can approach it next. Um, so last couple of questions that I asked everyone. Well, first, before we finish is like, what are your main goals right now with what you're doing? Cause you're doing a lot. It's a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of things. I'm like, we could list it all off. I could do it all in the <laughs> no, intro. I'm not going to do it. I'll get too stressed. Um, there's a lot of buckets, which I actually really like because I think like each bucket has its own merit and value and yeah. meaning. Um, I would say, I mean, I can start with like the company that Todd and I have yeah. together, which is, you know, very much swimming focused. And it's been such a blessing because it's brought, I basically pieced out from swimming for six years. Like, it's too painful. <laughs> like I'm out. I don't want to go to meet. I don't want to get back to work. Yeah. I don't, you know. And so during COVID, it, it was when we launched it. And um, it's just, you know, I got to go to World Trials and I handed out an award and I got to go and watch our athletes. And yeah. so it's really, we're growing it together. Yeah. We each have our strengths within it. And it's been really cool to work with these elite teams right. where their athletes are going to Olympic trials. And, and yeah. so that I would say um, 
I would say within that, it's just continuing to grow and work with, be very selective now mm-hmm. in the teams and the coaches and the individuals that we work with. Yeah. Um, which is, is really nice at, to be at that point. That's fun, yeah. Um, I would say for my speaking, um, get my book out. Um, I know. Now I'm excited. I'm really texting. <laughs> <laughs> get my book out um, and, and work to, you know, I would love to one day be on, you know, at VCon and, yeah. and at some of those bigger events. Um. I do some some work with uh, a startup that I, I love. So I, I work with the leading a sales team. And so helping that to continue to grow um, yeah. is is really exciting. And um, I just, I love startups. Obviously, we have one. Yeah. But I think uh, working with other female founders um, is, is really so impactful and um, has helped me grow a ton. Um, and then the advocacy work that I do with the National Blood Call Alliance. I testified on Capitol Hill recently. For funding from the CDC, mm-hmm. and so I'm hoping we continue to drive funds so that we can continue to save lives. Yeah, how can people get involved with that? Yeah, so uh, stoptheclot.org. They okay. can go. Uh, they can donate to my team because I'm running on behalf. No, of no, them. I'm going to do um, it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running on behalf of them um, in New York. Um, and then, yeah, there's a ton of information, and you can donate at yeah. any time. And um, they have a lot of just kind of. This definitely needs to get the word out. Like I don't even yes. know a lot about it, so I got to do my education. Yes. Now <laughs> your story. Um. Oh, did you? You can keep going. Oh, oh uh, I think that's all of um, <laughs> all of it. All right, and I and uh, I'd say on a personal level, Todd and I are are trying to have a kid this year. So, oh my goodness, Sorry, I was family. actually going to ask you that off camera <laughs> because then you're like, "There's not going to be a more beautiful child than <laughs> Katie Hoff and Todd and kid." Yeah, so we're excited about that. Yeah. Um, when it you know obviously when it happens, but um, it would just I feel like living here in Nashville, like we found such such a community so fast and yeah. we've only lived here five plus months and there's just so many amazing people yeah. and people that are kind of in that stage of either they're about to have kids or they have like one and two year olds yeah. um and so we just finally feel for the first time after moving around the country over the last decade that we've kind of found our our tribe right. our people our location it checks all the boxes yeah. and so it's really nice to feel like we can even like the fact that we even want to buy a house because right. we trust that we're gonna be here long yeah. enough. Um, is a it's big a good deal. sign. <laughs> it's a good sign. I'm usually we're like we may be gone in and a it's year. I'm not trying to. House ever. So yes, this yes. Little boy or girl will be lucky. Yes, yes. Um, and so my last questions that I ask everybody, um, would be first, do you like to read? And if so, what's your favorite book besides obviously your own? <laughs> my own. Um, <laughs> I am an audiobooker. Okay. Like, I don't love um, actually reading. Um, I'm currently reading uh, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, and it is. Wait, I actually have heard. Maybe I heard Brene Brown is a big author. She's, yeah, she's oh, also yeah. amazing. I admire her as a speaker and an author, right, but yeah. um, she's her whole, she, her whole work is dedicated around shame. Okay. A lot of things we were just talking about yeah. around like expectations and like it, she addresses all of it. So it's I mean, she has a ton of books, but I have to check it out. This one, I'm daring greatly. I like an audio book. It's easier for me to give more time to it. Yeah, you know, even running than, like a long yeah. run, listening to an audio book yeah. is. There's like runs. I'll go through things where I like I need to pump up. I need like Taylor Swift. Then I need yeah. country, <laughs> and then I need all these like. But then an audio book would be good. Yeah, it would take me long. Um, and then last, what would you tell the girl that's struggling to find her self confidence? self-worth I would say number one it's okay to reach out for help I think a lot of times when you're in that mode you feel like you're isolated on an island it's only you no one else could be feeling the same way as you and so while it's really scary to be vulnerable almost everyone around you is feeling the exact same thing so express it Find your obviously people that you trust, but express it and find your find your trust tree. I call it. I like um, it. <laughs> find your tree, um, and then I would say exploring self compassion. I think it's really that's, good. That I is think, really good. <laughs> yeah, there's, I'm terrible at it, uh, but I think as of recently, and Brene Brown talks about that a lot. But just I were someone gave the example of like your friend calls you, they just lost their job. You know, yeah. what are you saying to them? Like. You're gonna be okay. Pick yourself up. You're you've got an amazing skill set. Yeah. Every there's something on the horizon. You lose your job. What are you saying? Oh, that's really I good. suck. Yeah. I'm never gonna get through this. Like, why'd they fire me? It's my you know. So that's it's like so thinking, powerful right there. Yeah. I never thought about that. So it's like thinking about like what you what, what you would say to your friend and yeah. then how much how much we beat ourselves Self-self. up and that affects confidence. It affects self worth. Right. Everything. Not, yeah. Everything. So I think that self compassion, which is Again, 
leaning on your trust tree, yeah. it's really hard to just suddenly be like, I have self-compassion, right? right. But I think it's, it's going to take time. And I think so much time. Like, I mean, you just brought this up to me today. And I think I'm the type of friend that's like, you know, you got this. I'll send the long paragraphs of like mm-hmm. reminding my friends or I'll just, I used to do like the handwritten notes all the time to my friends mm-hmm. and like not for any reason, like they didn't do anything. It's just like, here's a little reason why you're all awesome. Yeah. Or I'd send it to the first person I thought of every single morning for like a year I did that. And, but there right were moments yet, yourself. And, yeah, there's moments <laughs> that year that I'm like, I'm never giving myself grace is a huge thing. And I'm not telling myself exactly the same things, mm-hmm. which you know, it's knowing the love you deserve and then also giving that love to yourself. So, so yeah. Is there anything else? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, just those two. Awesome. Well, <laughs> no, I, I think I, I always try to, st- I feel like two to three is always my goal because I think yeah. if you pick people, you know, go into this thing, they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to, ch- in anything, right? Yeah. If you're going after an endeavor in sport or just like, oh, I'm going to, you know, people are like, I'm going to run. Okay, I'm going to go do a half marathon. It's like, have you ever done a 5K? Yeah. You know? 10K. Like, I think anything it, in between. <laughs> yeah. Like I think, in, or like with, you know, dieting, people are like, I'm cutting out sugar completely. It's like, yeah, you're just going to, you know, so I think right. taking baby steps, like if you take on too much, that's not realistic. You you will fail mm-hmm. and then you get frustrated. So I think biting off small pieces, one to two things that you can consistently do over a long period of time yeah. is way better than trying to just be radical with it and right. not having it last long term. Right. Okay. Well, this was a great episode. Thank you so much yes. for coming on. I thank really you. have loved this hour. I mean, actually, I know. Well, <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you to everyone that tuned in today. You're awesome. Have a great day.